Hello, and welcome back to our Let's Be Neighbors series, where we seek out experts, local experts on topics of local interest. Um, tonight, we have a truly incredible group of people joining us to speak about human trafficking or modern day slavery. Uh, it is an underreported and under the radar crime, including here in Utah. Um, joining us tonight, we have Mick Spilker, who is the Czech Section Chief of the Investigations Division of the Attorney General's Office um, and helps the operating body of the human tra trafficking operations. We have Kara Durfee, who is the Chief Clinical Officer from Dahlia's Hope, and that is an aftercare organization dedicated to the healing and recovery of sex trafficking survivors, and is founded by Faith, who is also joining us tonight. We also have the honor of being joined by Julie Whitehead and Faith, two incredible survivors of human trafficking, both here locally and abroad, and who are willing to share their stories with us tonight. This is a full roster, and I want to give all of them the time to share their information and stories. So. I will let them introduce themselves further if they wish. Uh, because it is so full, please think of any questions you have early and put them in the chat um, publicly or message me privately. And so we can get, answer as many of them as possible as soon as the presentations are through. Thank you and let's begin. Julie, are you ready? Yes. Hi, it's an honor to be here tonight. Thank you so much for having me. My name is Julie Whitehead and I am a tr uh, survivor of sex trafficking. I get asked to speak about trafficking and it's always hard for me. I was trafficked at the age of 30. Um, so it seems like my story would start there, but really um, somebody who's healthy, who's had, I don't want to use the word normal because I don't like that, but um, a healthy upbringing with healthy support systems, um, healthy boundaries in place, that type of thing, somebody like that doesn't typically get snatched off the street and trafficked. So usually there's a vulnerability present and usually multiple. Um, traffickers exploit these vulnerabilities and that is how they take us and keep us hostage. <clears throat> I'll backtrack just a little bit to share how I became vulnerable to being a victim of sex trafficking um, and it began really early for me when I was about three or four years old, I began being sexually abused by my father. Um, the abuse really confused me. Uh, it was hard because I couldn't just point at my dad and say, bad guy, he's the one doing this to me. That was also my father, that was my protector, that was you know my caregiver. So it was really, really hard mentally to, um, to kind of figure that out and navigate it. it really confused my senses of boundaries, my personal senses of where I stop and where someone else begins, when I can say no. Um, I felt like I was the property of a man to be used for his pleasure, that it was something that I couldn't say no to and didn't have any autonomy with. Um, so I grew up with this kind of twisted sense of how things were and I was really, <clears throat> I was really um, used to bad treatment. And so when I turned into my teens, in my teen years, um, suddenly the abuse just ended. He told me that I was just suddenly too old for it and that it was over. And you would think that a celebration would be in order, but I was kind of confused and just didn't know why it had stopped and actually thought that maybe I had done something wrong. Um, so I kind of went into my teenage years looking for someone to save me from the situations that I had been in my whole life, uh, somebody that would kind of act as a hero. Uh, but I wasn't really picky. I had low standards for a relationship and I, I didn't see a lot of red flags. Even the ones that I did see, I ignored um, because I was used to tolerating so much abuse. So the first boyfriend I had, ended up being a very abusive boy too, um, but it was normal to me in a lot of ways. I mean, there were ways in which I recognized it and thought that this isn't right. I know other people aren't aren't having these issues with their boyfriends but or girlfriends, but, um, but I, I tended to overlook it. I tended to just give him the benefit of the doubt and I was wanting to fix him as much as I wanted him to fix me. Um, meaning that he had a broken home and I wanted to be there for him. I wanted to be his family and repair what was wrong in his world. 
Um, so the relationship ended up turning into a marriage of 12 years. And I had three children with him. And that might seem a little odd if it was so abusive. Why did I stay? But I, it's hard for me to explain even to myself. Sometimes I ask myself that question. But um, given the circumstances that I went into the relationship, I just didn't see a way out for one. Uh, he had blackmail against me, meaning he threatened to tell my parents that we had had premarital sex, um, which I thought would be the end of the world if my parents looked down on me for that. I also didn't know how my father would view that with our history of abuse. So he had these kind of blackmail ways that he kept me uh, tied to him. And I just didn't dare, I didn't dare challenge him on any of that. And so I stayed with him, married him had three kids. As time went by, the relationship just got worse and worse, um, more and more abuse. It just escalated. With every child that I had, I felt more trapped because now he said that he would make sure I lost custody of my children if I ever left him. So I find myself in 2006 just completely desperate, um, not able to tell anybody about the problems in my marriage with my relationship feeling trapped, um, and feeling really, really depressed. <clears throat> I actually became uh, to the point where I was thinking of taking my own life, and I had an attempt with that, and then um, was hospitalized. My ex-husband told me that by the time I'm released, I need to be completely better, completely healed, and have no more signs of depression, anxiety, um, anything like that. Well, that's not really possible to flip a switch and do that overnight. Um, but I was motivated because I didn't want to lose custody of my children. And I was afraid what my then husband would do. So I found a way to get a job teaching preschool. And it ended up being a saving grace for me. I was able to be there during the day with my kids and um, be away from home and have something to focus on that helped me kind of continue. <clears throat> uh, I, I stayed at the preschool and I was able to be there all during the day with my kids. They were able to come with me. And so I was feeling really lucky that I was, you know, had this avenue where I could exist um, at least somewhat happily for the time being. Um, unfortunately, that's where my trafficker comes into play. So. At the end of my marriage, things were really bad at home, but I was not speaking about them. I was not telling anybody. Our marriage was a closed book. I didn't talk to anyone about it. Um, but this father of a preschool, one of my preschool students started asking me questions like, how are things at home? How are you doing? He seemed to just know that things were off and I'm not sure how he knew. I wasn't sure how he knew then, but I was touched by it just for the fact that somebody saw me and saw my suffering, also terrified of it because if my husband found out that I was talking to a man, I would be in a lot of trouble. Um, then this man left the preschool and I didn't see or hear from him again for about eight months until the very day that my ex-husband was arrested for domestic violence. <clears throat> I received a text from a number that I had once known and I remembered that it was his father and he reached out and said that he felt inspired by God to reach out to me at that moment, uh, that he felt that something was going wrong and that I needed his help. And I didn't know what to make of that. Honestly, I felt like maybe this is my guardian angel finally, like maybe somebody's finally stepping into my life to save me from all these bad guys and and help me out. And so I, I kind of fell for it a little bit hard. Um, I also didn't have anybody as far as a support network to rely on. So I did rely on this man pretty heavily. Um, for the first two weeks, he was absolutely everything that I needed. He, he was like a guardian angel. Um, my ex-husband would break the protective order and drive by the house at night. And this father would stand guard literally on my porch making sure that my ex-husband didn't approach the house and that me and my children were safe inside. He brought us meals, made sure that we ate. He, he was grooming me, though of course I didn't know it at the moment, but he 
he saw all of the needs that I had and he filled them above and beyond. Um, I became very dependent on him very quickly because I was in a really dangerous um, situation without a support network. And so he became everything to me very quickly. Uh, it was just shortly after that, just about two weeks in when he raped me and everything completely changed. He became really controlling and really aggressive and abusive in just about every way possible told me that he would work with my ex-husband to make sure I lost custody of my children if I didn't do what he said. Um, he told me that we would be going on trips. I didn't know what these were. He just called them trips. Um, the first one was to California and he said that he had business there. He was an over the road truck driver. He said that he had business there, but on the day that he picked me up, he didn't have a trailer attached to his truck. So I found that really strange, but I mean, what did I know about the business? Um, I also wasn't in the position where I could ask a lot of questions and get answers because he was in charge of what I knew and what I didn't. Uh, so I went with him to California and we ended up in a motel, at a motel, where he uh, covered me with his coat and snuck me inside so that the office couldn't see. And he gave me some pills that I did not know what they were. Um, he made me take them and I became very drowsy and just very out of it. Um, I woke to find him shaving my legs in the shower and I was trying to make sense of everything, what was going on. Um, eventually another man entered the room and raped me also while my trafficker took pictures of the abuse. I didn't know the purpose of this at the time. I just thought it was really disgusting and terrifying. Uh, when we got home from the trip, I was really just shaken and shocked. Really, I, I didn't even know what to make of it. Like this, this man took me and shared me. That's what I called it. He shared me with someone else and they took pictures and I, I didn't even know that it was trafficking. I had no words for it at the time. Um, <clears throat> he told me that he would use the photos of me uh, to make sure that I don't, or that I would lose custody of my children if I didn't do exactly what he said. He threatened violence with a gun, with a knife. Um, he threatened against me, obviously. Also, he said that he would hurt my parents, my children. Um, I felt completely trapped. It was, there were times when my trafficker actually bound me with my hands and tied them up. And honestly, I felt more trapped than that, if you can imagine. Like, mentally, I was so, I, I didn't even see a way out. Um, I thought that he could destroy my life take my children from me, which was everything to me, um, or kill me or hurt my children, which I just couldn't let happen. And so I continued to do what he forced me into doing. Um, we traveled throughout the Western states. We went to Arizona, Montana, Nevada, um, Idaho, uh, just through all the different states. Um, we would end up sometimes at what looked like a normal looking house only to find out that it was a brothel inside. Um, sometimes we would go to, we went to Wendover uh, once and I was put in a hotel room and men were just brought in one after the other to me. And I, a lot of the time I was um, drugged or <clears throat> otherwise compromised so that I wasn't completely lucid for it, which kind of was a cruel blessing um, to not remember all parts of it, but also really scary to be incapacitated like that and to be out of control of myself in a situation that I didn't have much control of anyway. Um, he ended up, I left my marital home and he ended up getting me an apartment in Centerville and uh, he trafficked me out of the apartment also. He brought men there. Um, and then that was our base camp for where we would stay between trips. Also between, between trips, I would come home and 
have my children during the week and take them to school, go to PTA meetings, uh, you know, grocery shop, do all the th normal things that moms do, moms and dads. And uh, the whole time on the weekends, I'm being trafficked. It was such a such a stark contrast, the life that I was living from one day to the next. And um, it was absolutely terrifying. It lasted for five months. And I, during my time there, I saw children being trafficked as well as other women, both older than me and younger than me. Um, and then finally, I'm skipping a lot there. Just, it's very traumatic to remember. And uh, I don't wanna tell too many gory details, but um, at around the five month mark, my trafficker said that he would like me to meet with his employer to help negotiate the purchase of his truck. And um, normally, you know, I wouldn't be allowed to even look at a waiter or something without getting in trouble, but he set this up to speak with his employer. So I went and met with him and I didn't know the first thing about buying a truck, but I just, you know, got on Kelly Blue Book and did a little research and kind of faked it. Well, his boss didn't really buy it. And he just sat back and said, what's really going on here? Something doesn't add up to me. My gut's telling me that something's wrong. I don't know if it was just, I was so desperate by that point um, and just felt like everything was coming to a head and I wasn't sure I was gonna survive the next few days. I don't know what it was, but I, I did open up to him. I told him that I was unsafe, that I was in an unsafe relationship, I called it, because I really didn't know what else to call it and I didn't know what it was. Um, he said that he would help me get out of it. Uh, I stayed at his house for a couple of nights um, until I was eventually able to move back in with my parents, which was not ideal, but uh, at least safe or safer. Um, so I moved in with my parents and then about four months later, I'm actually, I married the man, my trafficker's employer. Uh, we got married. My trafficker continued to stalk me for about three years and I got a civil and a criminal stalking injunction against him. And then I entered therapy treatment. Um, I actually found my way to Tennessee and then to Boston, Massachusetts for treatment because it was a really hard thing finding somebody who was qualified to deal with my level of trauma. And in Boston, while I was in treatment, I found out that my trafficker was uh, facing a, a, a um, a court appearance to possibly be deported. I felt like it was really important for me to tell what my trafficker had done to me. So I was able to get in touch with the prosecutor from the Department of Homeland Security. And he let me come and testify on three different days uh, in front of my trafficker uh, using my testimony and the other evidence and things that they had against him. He was finally deported and he's no longer in the United States, which helps me sleep a little better at night. Um, although I find myself looking over my shoulder all the time. But all these years later, I am now in therapy still, and I work with an organization called the Malou Foundation, which fights sexual exploitation and trafficking. And um, I speak wherever I can, tell my story, it's not comfortable to tell by any means, um, but I, I just really want to spread awareness. I feel like I lived in one of the safest places that you could live in little Davis County, Utah. Um, thought it was really safe, but this happened to me there. It happened to me in all different counties throughout Utah. And um, I think sometimes that we think we're safe and that's good, that's great, but we need to know what's out there and what's potentially out there that could hurt us. And so I spread my message in the hopes of creating awareness around trafficking so that people know that it does happen right here in our backyard and across America as well. Thank you, Faith. Uh, thank you. <laughs> I'm sorry, Julie. I'm on to Faith already, but anyway, thank you, Julie, so much for your story. <laughs> and let's see, Faith, are you ready? It. See if we can make you the presenter. Oh, no. Let's see. 
We can't hear you yet. I'm gonna try and move you onto the stage. And... You were unmuted for a second. <laughs> Try again. Uh, let's see. Um, if you can go to the, there's a small arrow at the bottom of the mute and it can change your settings. And so you want to go to the speaker and just click and hello on the different options. There's usually two or three that you can pick from. No. Yeah, so try the arrow down and then just click through each of them and then just try speaking and we'll see if anything um, clicks through. Mm -hmm. Try again. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes. Oh. <laughs> okay. Right. We got Thank it. You. Uh, hi. <laughs> hi everyone, my name is Faith Robles. And I am a survivor of child of sex trafficking. I was trafficked at the age of 14 years old. I met my trafficker when I was 13 years old. I am from originally from Mexico and I was brought from Mexico into the United States and taken directly into New York City. I had no clue what happened to me. And Basically, one night, my boyfriend, he said to me that now I had to go and sleep with men, which I had no clue about it and on what it meant. I was trafficked for three years and a half. I escaped right before I turned 18 years old. Uh, well, during the time that I was trafficked, I was numerous of times beaten up by my traffickers, by the buyers. And I have gotten a lot of injuries due to the trafficking. So I do have pain until this day. I had to had a multiple jaw surgeries, including a TMJ surgery. But right after I, when I escaped, Thankfully, I was able to go to the police station. They were able to put me in touch with a nonprofit in New York City, and they were able to help me, but for a short term. They were only able to provide me therapy for a short term. I was able to get some legal resources. English is my third language. Um, Spanish is my second language, and I grew up speaking a native Mayan dialect known as all. Um, so it was hard for me to communicate, but at the same time, I had a hard time finding resources. In 2017, I had the opportunity to be able to move to Utah and I was able to meet with Matt, Sherston, uh, Chris and Anne. And I had told Mama Sherston that I had this dream where I wanted survivors to have a place where to go and find the resources that they need, resources that I felt like I didn't get them at the time. And I wanted for the survivors to not be told no as an answer, uh, because that's what I was told if you are 18 years old or older, you don't get to be part of those services. But if you're a minor, you can. Housing that was a big challenge as well. So thankfully they were able to hear me and listen to me. And we were able to create Dahlia's Hope. And 
all of this is because of my dream and we provide therapy, uh, recreational therapy, mental health, 101s, um, education. And what has helped me throughout my healing process basically has been having therapy, having the resources that I feel like I need to be able to become independent, to be able to uh, do my advocacy work. Um, I also, I am part of a survivor, uh, of a survivor's council of ECPAT USA, and I do legislation work, advocacy work, and prevention. That is be, being very important to me. And at the same time, I love working with other survivors because I have told them that, yes, it's not easy to go and work towards your healing and go and try to heal those memories that it had hurt us so bad in the past. But at the same time, there is a good upcoming from it because we are able to be functional, to have a better job, to become independent, which it was, it's very important. And a lot of people might think that survivors, we cannot be independent or being capable of doing some stuff. I'm the proof of it, <laughs> that we can learn new stuff if we have the resources that we need. And at the same time, the community is part of it. I have gotten help from the community uh, in Utah, and that has actually helped a lot myself. And I do believe that if we all come together and hear these stories uh, and do prevention in, in Utah, it will actually help to save um, to kind of, I don't want to say safe because most of the time I have a hard time with that, uh, to prevent of not happening to another child, to being trafficked because it's the worst thing ever. But at the same time, if there is prevention and at the same time, if survivors know that there is Dahlia's hope that we are here to provide hope to every survivor and that there is healing uh, and there is a better future for us, we will actually be able to do a big difference in this community. So thank you. Thank you, Faith. Thank you, Julie. All right. So we're going to go straight on to Mick, who helps oversee operations to um, to all of this. So anyway, um, uh, let me make you the presenter or bring you to the top and then just take it away whenever you're ready, Mick. Thank you. I'm uh, Mick Stoker. I'm a section chief uh, with the Utah Attorney General's Office Investigations Division. Uh, one of the groups, I, one of the units I supervise is the Secure Strike Force and we investigate human trafficking cases. Um, and Thank you, Julie and Faith, for sharing your experiences. Um, that takes a lot to do that. Um, having been in they're probably the hardest cases to investigate. I think a couple things that I need to get out are basically what is human trafficking. Um, there's so many misconceptions, which I'll talk a little bit about as well, but Human trafficking is exploiting a person using force, fraud, or coercion um, for the purpose of labor or commercial uh, sex. Um, some examples of force are obviously physical harm or restraints or sexual assault or confinement and isolation. Um, the fraud part is false promises of employment, um, working conditions, a better life, wages, and a relationship. Uh, the coercion part, there's so many different uh, elements involved with that. It's psych it can be psychological abuse, manipulation, physical and psychological isolation, uh, blackmail. You know, there's just so many. Uh, and the traffickers, they have this, uh, they seek out vulnerable people um, 
and and take advantage of them for the purpose of money as well as you know other types of uh things um but having investigated several of these types of cases, you know, the misconceptions that are out there are people have a tendency to, to believe that traffickers are brought in and by the bus load or a van and they're all chained up and they pull up to a hotel and escort them in. Um, some other misconceptions are there was going around where if you saw a mark on your car, you were marked to be taken and trafficked. Um, those are a few of the misconceptions. There's so many different things out there, but um, people always ask, you know, what to look for. And sometimes you don't really see anything because they're what's referred to as the invisible rope. Um, there's just so many ways these traffickers manipulate and take advantage of people, whether it's through uh, affection and attention, uh, drugs is the big one. You know, they they see that they're someone's addicted to drugs, and so they feed them those drugs and tell them that they'll stop providing it for them if they stop working for them. Um, there's just so many different things. Again, people, you know, I guess the easiest way to say in dealing with this is if you see something suspicious, report it. And there's several places you can call in tips, you know, obviously your local law enforcement, um, but obviously there's gotta be a little bit of some details as well. You know, just calling up and saying, you saw something that looks suspicious. Well, you know, you gotta answer the question, what is it that's suspicious? And, and something that you can report that you, someone can follow up on. Um, and it's not to say you rush in and put yourself in danger, but be a good witness and and, you know, if you remember a license plate, write it down, a hotel room or a house, you know, it doesn't hurt to call and report that because, you know, we'll try and follow up with it or we usually will follow up on if we have something to follow up on that's been reported. Um, again, some of the trafficking cases that, that our office has been involved in, um, we haven't dealt with a lot of infant or not infant, but child uh, trafficking cases. Um, we have had, you know, several um, where the survivors were 16 or 14 or, you know, 17. Um, and that's another thing I forgot to mention. As far as trafficking goes, any minor under the age of 18 engaged in commercial sex is a victim of human trafficking. We don't need to show that there was force, fraud, or coercion under those circumstances. Um, but again, these cases, there's not one case that's the same. They're all different. They do have similar, you know, tendencies in them. But again, these these cases, it's it's a lot. You know, when you're dealing with the survivor. You know, obviously, they're the main priority in this. It's not whether we got the criminal charge. You know, they're the main priority. If we can get in and get somebody out and we don't get criminal charges and they get the help they need and the services, then and that's a win. Um, let's see. But again, the, the ones that we've dealt with, we've had... Uh, you know, where they, again, the, the, the survivor has been falling in love with an individual and they use that as their driving thing, you know, hey, I'll provide you clothing and a place to live and how much they love each other. And then once the hook's been set, then they, they say, hey, you got to start working for me and, and then they're in. Um, but again, around here, the cases, it, it seems like there's... Uh, drugs the, the women are have an addiction issue and and the traffickers seek that out and take advantage of them and and that's where we're where we're able to to get a lot of them out of it and then put into the treatment that they need 
as far as how we work those, I, I'm not going to get into much details on how we work those cases. Um, a lot of them obviously come in through people that see something and call it in, and then we're able to follow up on it, which leads to a, a good case. Um, obviously, we want to be able to put the traffickers in a place where they can't get out and take advantage and uh, of these the women and men and children that are involved in this. Um, I can't say that there's really one sign to look for in this. There's just so many different things. That they could be people that, that you know personally that have no idea what's going on. And next thing you know, you know, they're they're doing stuff that that you would never think and by someone that you never thought would do that. Um, other than that, I really don't have a lot to go into. I, I think it's this is more of a question. You know, I'd be happy to answer questions about this. Um, we do have a tip line at the AG's office. Um, the number is 801-200-3443. And then there's also a national tip line, 888-373-7888. Um, All right, thank you. Thank you, Mick. And yeah, you're right. They might be best as questions and answers. So feel free to put them in the chat and we can answer them because it's being recorded. The chat isn't saved, but we can hopefully get them answered that way. So thank you. And we are actually doing really good on time. So think of questions and we'll be ready to answer them as quickly as possible. So we'll move over to um, Kara. I'll get you onto the stage. There you are, and whenever you're ready. Okay, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, I am Kara Durfee, and I am the Chief Clinical Officer of Dahlia's Hope, and I am a licensed therapist, and I've been working with um, trafficking survivors for two years now at Dahlia's Hope um, with a full career working in trauma. Um, I'm going to start out sharing a quick little short video with you um, that will give you more information about Dahlia's Hope and what we do. And then I will give a full presentation about our program and what our services are. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. And hopefully this will work. I am a student. I am a wife. I am a businesswoman. I am a fighter. And I am a sex trafficking survivor. There are an estimated 40.3 million victims of human trafficking globally. Because many cases go unreported, this number is certainly much higher with an estimated 1.2 million sex trafficking survivors in need right here in the United States. There are only about 1,000 total spaces available in programs nationwide that would help survivors recover. Dahlia's Hope meets survivors where they are, creating a personal plan tailored to their individual healing needs. We offer clinical therapy, recreational therapy, medical resources, education opportunities, case management, transitional housing, and vocational training, all with a focus on trauma healing to create hope in their lives, hope for healing, hope for change, hope for their future. We give each survivor the resources they need to create the life they dream of. These resources are provided by supporters like you. Dahlia's Hope is helping me heal from my trauma. Dahlia's Hope is helping me transform my life. Dahlia's Hope has helped me pursue an education. They are helping me write a new chapter of hope. I feel safe. I feel empowered. I have hope for my future. I feel hope for my children. I have hope that I can heal. Now there is hope. My name is Faith. I'm a sex trafficking survivor, and I had a dream of creating a place like Dahlia's Hope, an aftercare program that offers 
opportunities for survivors to heal and create the lives they dream of and deserve. A place where supporters can go to provide help and resources. Dahlia's Hope provides what I wish I had before and what so many survivors still need. So many survivors are fighting on their own. You can open doors for them by becoming part of the solution. Join us, offer them hope, and make a difference. Okay, can you guys hear me? I hope. Um, yes, we can. Okay. <laughs> can you see this little screen on my presentation? Yes. <clears throat> okay. So we heard from um, Faith and um, Julie both, but, and thank you both for being so brave and for um, sharing your story. Um, Faith is the founding survivor for Dahlia's Hope, and we are um, an aftercare program, as that video shared, and we have really built this program around Faith's dream, and what Faith has told us would have been beneficial for her when she was you know, needing resources and um, trying to overcome some of the obstacles after her trafficking experience. <clears throat> I want to talk a little bit about the problem here, and I appreciate Mick's um, comments on this also, because I really do feel like sex trafficking is something that's often misunderstood or misrepresented in the media. And so the problem of sex trafficking um, can be a little fuzzy for some people. So um, it is modern slavery, right? It is sexually exploiting individuals through the use of force, fraud, or co coercion. It can look different for every survivor um, but oftentimes it isn't what we would expect based on the media. It isn't, you know, most of the time it isn't kidnapping. Um, you know, it is the use of manipulation and psychological tactics and other forms of force, fraud and coercion to, um, you know, kind of as we heard a little bit from Faith and Julie. Um, trafficking is the fastest growing crime globally with an estimated 40.3 million victims worldwide. And this is, you know, a huge crime and it makes billions of dollars. Um, so people are, are motivated, the people, the traffickers who are benefiting from this. There are an estimated 1.2 million survivors of trafficking and need of aftercare services in the United States. And that is a very rough estimation because oftentimes this is a crime that goes unreported or the victims of this crime might not know what's happening to them. Kind of as Julie spoke of, that is a very common experience where, um, you know, it's obvious that there's some sort of abuse happening or they don't feel safe, but they don't have the language or understanding to label it trafficking and know what's happening to them. So that's very common. Um, the average age of a, a person is first trafficked is 12. Um, that's just an average. Trafficking and exploitation happens at all ages. And I really like, um, you know, that our survivors today have stories that represent that, where it it is, often that survivors will be trafficked as an adult. And I think a lot of times people think this is a crime that's only happening to children, um, but all ages, um, this happens at all ages. Um, average is 12, so we know that it's happening to children. Children are obviously extra vulnerable, just developmentally, because of the stage of life that they're in, but I just want it to be 
um, known that trafficking happens at all ages. And we've had survivors in our program in their teens all the way up into their 50s. Um, 40% of trafficked children are sold by a family member. A lot of trafficking is familial and it is trusted individuals. It's parents, caregivers, grandparents, boyfriends, spouses. Um, you know, it's, it's not usually a stranger. It's somebody who is close and has infiltrated and has um, trust that they abuse and misuse. Um, we have a lot of survivors in our program who were trafficked by family. Um, sometimes trafficking also might look like ritualistic abuse. And we have quite a few survivors in Utah of ritualistic abuse where religion and um, other um, things are brought into the abuse situation. Um, so that is also trafficking is ritualistic abuse. 99% of survivors are never identified. So we know this is a really big problem that's really under underreported. And of the 1% who are identified, very few actually receive aftercare services. Um, both Julie and Faith spoke of their um, experiences getting help and receiving services. And it's so important and so many of the survivors don't know how to access services and don't receive the care that they really need. And there's not a lot of programs um, that focus solely on trafficking. Um, Julie spoke of, of, you know, needing to go out of state to get the care that she needed. And that is very common. There's only approximately a thousand spaces in aftercare programs that are specific to trafficking nationwide. And this is one of the reasons that Dahlia's Hope exists is because, you know, this is a very specific type of trauma that is very complex and requires very specialized care. And so because of that, not a, a lot of programs um, have the training and the staff and the programming set up that will um, be most effective. So that is one of the reasons Dahlia's Hope exists. 80% um, of survivors end up going back to trafficking, being re-victimized if they don't have a safe place to go and they don't get help. So we know this is a big problem and limited resources and critical um, that survivors get help and aftercare. Dahlia's Hope was founded in 2019 um, with inspiration from Faith's personal experience gathering resources after her trafficking experience. She struggled to get resources um, and she dreamed of a place where she could get all of her needs met in one place. And that is one of the main purposes of Dahlia's Hope. We want to be easy to find and we want to be kind of like a one-stop shop because one of the things that can be really challenging when you are a survivor of trafficking is going to multiple different community agencies or partners and trying to, to and having to retell their story. Um, retelling their story, especially early on in, you know, before they've received therapy and the treatment that they need, it can be very re-traumatizing. And so one of the goals of Dahlia's Hope is to be this one-stop shop where um, they don't have to retell their story. They can just um, tell us, you know, a pace that is comfortable for them and survivor-led, and we can help connect them to all of the resources they need, both at Dahlia's Hope and in the community without having to retell the story. It was also important to, to Faith that Dahlia's Hope was easy to find. So we try to be very accessible and um, also, you know, that there is survivor input. So our program is outpatient. We provide aftercare. It's survivor-led, um, survivor-focused, and holistic. 
So we try to really look at the survivor as a whole. Our mission is to provide holistic, trauma-informed aftercare services to survivors of sex trafficking. With a focus on trauma healing and best practices, we provide a multi-tiered approach to reach individuals in varying stages of recovery. Our goal is to help each survivor create a life worth living that allows them to be successful and independent. And you heard Faith speak a little bit about the importance of being independent. Um, that is a huge part of our mission. We want to equip this, the survivors that we work with with all the skills that they need to eventually not no longer need us and become um, self-sufficient self and independent. We, um, you know, we do meet the survivor where they're at, but it is important that I just mention that we are not residential and we're not, um, you know, kind of like a crisis center for survivors. We provide more of that long-term aftercare, you know, kind of after those initial, that, that initial residential care has um, already taken place. <clears throat> so these are our core holistic aftercare services, clinical therapy, recreational therapy, case management, and transitional housing. And I will go into each of these areas and expand more upon them to kind of give you a better idea of what our services look like. Um, with our clinical therapy, um, we do require that all of our survivors participate in clinical therapy. Clinical therapy is such a critical part of healing. And the focus of clinical therapy is really that um, trauma recovery. But we offer weekly outpatient therapy. We offer both in-person or Zoom options to Utah residents. So all of our services are specific to Utah residents. Um, individual, and, and that's to kind of give you more information why that is, is because Utah doesn't have um, a lot of specialized, I mean, we're really the only specialized aftercare program that only focuses on survivors um, of trafficking. And so we do require that our survivors are Utah residents, um, but we do serve all ages and all genders. So we take each referral on a case by case basis. Um, everything that we offer is completely free to the survivor and is covered by donations. So um, there is on our website, there's a link to donate to Dahlia's Hope. Um, all of this is funded by donations and grants and just generous people. Individual therapy, um, our treatment plans are individualized based on each survivor's unique needs. And all of our survivors are unique. And, um, so we really try to cater what we're doing in therapy to, to each individual. We offer therapy on average one time a week, but we might have survivors who at times might need individual therapy twice a week or three times a week. So we will cater to the survivor based on their needs. And the therapy is focused on healing their complex trauma and developing healthy relationships and then working towards, you know, independence. Trafficking survivors often have PTSD, depression, anxiety, panic disorders. Um, it's come up already, substance abuse disorders. A lot of times sex trafficking and drug trafficking go hand in hand, and it's not uncommon that traffickers will, will intentionally force um, or encourage drug and alcohol use during the trafficking experience. And that can also be a way that traffickers will prolong the abuse. They will get the victim to a point where they are now dependent on the substances that they provide, you know, that go hand in hand with the sex trafficking. So oftentimes substance abuse disorders um, can also be part of their experience. And dissociative disorders. We see a very high level of dissociative disorders 
and dissociation that happens with the trafficking experience. Um, dissociative identity disorder can be very common as well. Um, dissociation is kind of a way that the brain um, protects the victim and um, it helps them to survive the experience. And then oftentimes it, it requires treatment after um, traffic after their trafficking experience is over. Um, so there's a wide range of diagnoses that might come up as a result of their trafficking trauma. And so we're looking to treat those um, with, with the trauma therapy. I'll talk a little bit more about some of the specific therapies we use in just a minute. Um, we also offer group therapy. So we have a wide range of group therapies that are offered every week. And we have both in-person and virtual options. Um, right now we're offering, you know, meditation, yoga, psychoeducation, process groups, and um, dialectical behavioral therapy, DBT groups. Um, so we do, we are very careful with group therapy. We wanna make sure that our survivors are ready for that group setting, but the group setting can be such a powerful setting for healing and sharing experiences. And oftentimes survivors of trafficking can feel very isolated and as if nobody understands their situation and what they've been through. And so the, the community that comes from doing things together in a therapeutic group environment is really powerful. We focus on using best practices in trauma therapy. So our therapy, as I mentioned, it's really focused on that trauma healing piece, which is a very, um, it's very hard work for the survivor. This trauma therapy and healing from trauma, it's hard work. Um, so we use eye movement, desensitization and reprocessing. So EMDR, um, EMDR is one of the best practices in, in trauma therapy. We are also this year, we're going to be opening up and getting some training in accelerated resolution therapy, which is a newer form of therapy similar to EMDR um, conceptually, but different approach and um, very positive results with trauma survivors. Trauma-focused cognitive behavioral therapy is another approach we might use. And then internal family systems therapy, IFS, is, is very um, critical when working with dissociative identity disorder. And um, so we also incorporate that into our, um, our practice. We also have a therapy that focuses on, you know, just DBT principles, which is mindfulness, interpersonal effectiveness, distress tolerance, and emotional regulation. <coughs> Excuse me. Recreational therapy is also a big part of our program and probably one of my favorite parts of our program. It is so important and impactful and it's such a good complement to the clinical therapy that we offer. The goals of our our recreational therapy is to really complement what we're doing and, and accelerate healing. Recreational therapy is highly beneficial to survivors of trauma. Um, I mean, I would really argue it's beneficial to everyone, but um, there's lots of research that supports that it's beneficial to survivors of trauma. Movement and recreation assist with moving trauma out of the body. Um, you know, especially sexual trauma, it's such a physical um, trauma. And so movement and recreation um, can help move trauma and out of the body and can kind of help um, survivors to be in a good place clinically when, when it's time for their clinical therapy to address things that come up in recreational therapy. This program seeks to reduce symptoms of trauma it provides real life opportunity to apply coping skills, provides social opportunities, 
Um, I mentioned that sense of community that um, can come from that group setting. That is probably one of the biggest benefits of recreational therapy. That's the feedback we get from our survivors is that they feel like they have a sense of community and belonging, um, engagement. And we work really hard also to, um, we work really hard to also um, connect our survivors with the community. We also um, focus on relational, physical, educational, emotional, and spiritual domains in this program. We offer both individual and group opportunities. And, um, you know, there's community-based outings, events, plays, festivals, shopping, you know, just everyday community activities that our survivors get to participate in. Animal-assisted interventions that happen at our therapeutic farm um, are recreational therapists lead that art yoga meditation dance you name it um adventure outings rock climbing backpacking river rafting snowboarding we also offer individual case management services so each survivor is assigned a case manager we complete a needs assessment to ensure that we understand their their unique needs and then we connect them with the appropriate resources so not only are we looking to meet their needs, but we're also looking to help them to achieve their hopes and dreams. Um, that's where that our mission statement of creating a life worth living. You know, we really try to help them with that. Um, you know, some of the things our case manager might assist a survivor in accessing safe and affordable housing, um, our transitional housing any sort of community or government resources, educational and vocational resources, trauma-informed medical and dental resources, legal resources, life skills training, anything that our survivor needs, our case manager has connections and resources. We do have a transitional housing component to our program. Um, we are only transitional housing, so we're not residential, we're not um, a safe house, but we have a soft place to land for survivors who may might be in need of that. Um, you know, the program's really designed for a six to 24 month stay. Um, we don't put limitations per se, but that's probably a good average. Um, you know, I'd say an average six months is pretty common, but you know, we're open to longer stays. Um, survivors must be engaged in our program for at least 90 days. The transitional house is monitored regularly by staff. It's in a safe private location in Utah County. We have security cameras. Um, the survivors must be employed and be able to provide for their own transportation, be willing to learn independent living skills. And um, one of the beautiful parts of the transitional house is they have access to our therapeutic farm. So we do have a therapeutic farm and the purpose of the farm is for healing and therapy. Um, so animal assisted therapy and interventions happen at the farm. Um, just being at the farm is one of my favorite places to be. It's just a peaceful, beautiful, calm environment. And our animals are just so amazing. These are two of our horses. This is princess and star. Um, we have horses, goats, pigs, chickens. Um, we also offer horticultural therapy, yoga, mindfulness, and volunteer service opportunities at the farm. We have helped 54 survivors with aftercare services since our founding in 2019, and we are so proud of that. And um, we look forward to serving more this year. This is just a little bit of information about the referral process. If you go to our website, um, which is located here, daliashope.org, um, there is our phone number, our info email, and you can contact us through there. You can use any of those methods if you have a referral or if you need help, um, please reach out to us. The process from there is that we have a screener that we complete just to make sure that you fit our criteria. We you know, are specific to trafficking survivors and um, survivors that need outpatient. If somebody needs a residential program or they need detox from drugs or alcohol first, we can help connect them to the right place and then they can eventually come get services from Dahlia's Hope, but um, we would need some any of our survivors to be stable enough for outpatient. 
And then from there, if we screen them and they're appropriate for the program, we schedule and complete an intake appointment and assessment with a clinical therapist. And if we feel like our program is appropriate, we will schedule services. Right now, we do have a short wait list. We have a, um, about two people on the wait list right now, so it's, it's getting shorter, but we have a, do have a short wait list. Um, if we get a referral and they're not appropriate for our program, we work with our partners to find more appropriate care. So we can still be a resource and we're happy to help find the right place if, it, if we're not the right place. We have national partnerships with both the NTSA, the National Trafficking Shelter Alliance, and the Safe House Project. So the NTSA is a network of service providers committed to enhancing services and increasing access to care for survivors of trafficking. And so we work very closely with them and the Safe House Project who can also help with, um, you know, placement of survivors if, you know, they need residential care, but they also do a lot of education and we participate in training and, um, and they're just a great resource as well. Other trafficking resources, um, I, I am going to add to my PowerPoint for next time um, the, the Utah number with the AG's information. So um, the, the Polaris Project is a great resource on watch. And I think I saw this come up in the chat briefly, but um, the Maloof Foundation and Safe House Project have come up with this fantastic training program called On Watch that I highly recommend that helps if you're interested in knowing more about how to identify trafficking or what it might look like in real life in the community based on real stories of real survivors, please check out On Watch at IamOnWatch.org. Um, and we love the Maloof Foundation as well. And then the National Human Trafficking Hotline. So the information is here with the phone number. If you do a quick little Google search with National Human Trafficking Hotline, all kinds of helpful information will come up. Um, you can call them anytime. They also can offer resources. So thank you so much for letting me share about Dahlia's Hope. And I know there's probably questions. Um, and so I'll turn the time over to you for those questions. All right, yes, this is, thank you. Thank you everyone so much. And yes, um, those attending, this is the chance where you can absorb and type in your questions in the chat. We have one, um, but it does tie almost directly back into the stuff that Kara and Faith and Julie and Mick have already said throughout about how to identify traffickers. Um, specifically, the question was, let's see, um, what are some common things that people report other than something seems off? And it does seem to be that it is very individual. And I will let it open this up again, but just to reiterate that the on watch training seems to be a very solid, very good place to go. So the I am on watch.org has multiple trainings, as Faith in the chat was saying. And there's also the one that wasn't mentioned. Um, it's www.ecpatusa. So I am. Faith, if you want to pop in and correct me on this, ECPAT USA, and <laughs> yeah, go ahead. So ECPAT USA is a nonprofit. Um, the CEO is my lawyer, and we the education is actually available for parents, teachers, students, hotels, and for persons who travels. Um, and the trainings that are available there is actually uh, all of the information came from survivors like myself. So this is like a unique type of training that you get because the youth link that I share, I went I went through it before it became available. Um, so I feel like this one for those who have kids in high school, it can actually help them to kind of learn the signs. And if they see something, at least they could know where to go and ask for help. So it's ecpetusa.org. That is incredible. Thank you, Faith. And to hear it's based on survivors, all the more valuable. So thank you. Um, let's see. 
Yeah. Oh, yeah. So um, Kara's already answered. Are there volunteer opportunities at Dahlia's Hope? And yes, you can be a volunteer at Dahlia's Hope on our website. So if you want to explain more on that, just for the recording. Yes, yes, we we love volunteers and we love community engagement at Dahlia's Hope. So you can go onto our website and sign up to be a volunteer and it'll take you through kind of a process. I do always like to kind of give the caveat that a lot of our volunteer opportunities are not working directly with survivors. Sometimes we get volunteers who are really eager to work directly with survivors, but most of the work that we do with survivors, um, we do with professionals and we're very careful with using, you know, volunteers um, specifically working directly with the survivors. But there are sometimes opportunities where our volunteers might have skill sets that our survivors need. So we we do utilize volunteers and their skill sets for certain things like, you know, driving practice or um, helping with budgeting, things like that. But where we we really need help with volunteers is fundraising. As I mentioned, all of our um, all of our survivors get free care thanks to donors, and we are always looking for volunteers who want to help fundraise. Um, no amount of fundraising is too small. Um, you know that is where we really love to have volunteers. But we also have a lot of opportunities on our farm. We need a lot of help taking care of the animals and cleaning up. So. Um, we, we love having volunteers help us out. So please, if you're interested, sign up on our website. So thank you. And Sarah, your question kind of got answered right as it popped in. So help on the farm covers all kinds of. of yes. <laughs> and, um, let's see this one, I think would be for Mick. This one came into me privately. Um, let's see. Oh, I need to pop up my question. Okay. Um, what are, and this can be for anyone on top of that as well It's like, what are the signs for grooming? Um, because it seemed like a lot, they were accessing vulnerable populations, but there's like a pre thing that maybe prevention can help. There's so many things that factor in grooming. I mean, it's, it's was what Julie mentioned, you know, they kind of befriend you and then they can kind of fill out what you uh, what you need. And then they just zone in on that and, you know, provide what you, what you need. And then, you know, once, I, well, again, once they got that hook in you, you know, it, uh, basically, you know, they're alone at that point and the, the person's providing everything for you. I mean, there's so many ways that, you know, they, they shower you with affection, basically, and make you feel good. And then, you know, again, there's just so many different ways people can get groomed. Mm -hmm. I would also just add, too, that there's lots of, you know, there's there can be risk factors. So, um, you know, you're at high risk of human trafficking if you have an unstable home life or living situation, history of domestic violence. Um, you have a substance abuse issue or maybe you have a caregiver or family member who does um runaways and children who are in you know either foster care or juvenile justice systems can be at increased risk um if you're undocumented that could put you at an increased risk too because um oftentimes they'll use that fear of getting you in trouble for being on undocumented to you know continue to um abuse you poverty, um, having history of sexual abuse, those can all be risk factors. So they do seek out vulnerable individuals and they're really good at that. And they're also good at figuring out how to manipulate you and what works. Oftentimes they'll threaten um, victims to, you know, physical harm, death, not only to themselves, but also to their family members. Yeah, and a note to that, uh... We actually did have a case where uh, an older adult male was, you know, in a particular neighborhood and he was befriending all the juvenile boys, you know, all different ages. And it was just kind of odd. People were calling in, you know, he was always had them with him in his car. You know, we had them over at his house. Um, again, he would, 
he would provide them with money or spice or, you know, alcohol even, you know, he was always, he, but he always had them with him. And that's, you know, again, another indicator, something that, that just doesn't look right or, or feel right. You know, it wasn't just a matter of, you know, one or two, you know, we had, I think by the end of it, we had 15 juvenile boys identified that were involved in this. And again, they came from, you know, families, you know, maybe with single parent or something, but they were always out, you know, doing stuff. He started off by having them sell drugs at school. And then it turned into other things. And, you know, that's just how it works. You know, they, they befriend you and take advantage of you and provide you with things that you need. Okay, I'm going to have this one pop up because it's a natural lead in. So um, I'll read it straight. It's Mick. Um, you mentioned also that it's important not to, to take care of yourself and not to endanger ourselves when noticing a possible victim. Um, is there something we can do to help identify a victim? Just asking for, you know, even asking a simple, unassuming question. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, obviously, if you if you approach him too, you could put the the victim in danger as well. Um, again. You know, write down a license plate, you know, some kind of detail that you're able to, to, once you report it, we can follow up and confirm, you know, okay, this person may have a background of something that we can start digging into and maybe get do a little surveillance, whatever we need to do to try and get it going. But again, there's, it's, it's just don't put yourself in danger is what it boils down to or put the victims in in harm's way by um, trying to approach them, you know, again, document what you see right away as fast as you can so you can report it. License plate, description, maybe, maybe the person has tattoos that are very noticeable or unique, you know, things like that, that, that we could follow up and try and identify it, you know, hotel they're at, room number, the date, time, you know, any kind of detail that, again, something that we can be able to follow up on and hopefully later corroborate. Okay, yeah, this person comes to this hotel or, you know, gas station and he's always there at a certain time and he's always got, you know, the same person with him or, you know, different people with him every time. So it, again, I, you could talk forever about it. It's just basically, if you see something that's suspicious, you know, try and remember what you can, the best you can, if you have to write it down, something that you can, you know, report, but don't think reporting something is stupid because sometimes the people that report something end up, you know, we're able to, find out, okay, this law enforcement agency has something similar happen, and it just happens to be the same person, and that's how the case has started. Thank you, and thank you for encouraging that it's like, it's not a scary thing to report, <laughs> and if it's innocent, correct, that it's, no one's going to get in trouble, like if it turns out it's not, if it's not true, then... No, I mean, not, nothing reported is going to get anybody in trouble. I mean, obviously, if you call up and say, you know, I I did this or that, you know, I don't know. It, it's you can scenario it to death, but the best thing is, is if you see something suspicious, make sure you you have something that we're able to follow up on. I mean, if you call up and say, hey, I saw a 14 year old girl go into the restaurant. She was crying, and she was with the man. I mean that doesn't help us because, you know, it could be a, an upset child and that's the father, you know, we don't have any way to identify anybody. But okay, I'm going to extrapolate here since I have um, a mouthpiece because our webinar people can't unmute um, is say they're crying child and if someone was in it would it still be good to do any identifiers that did look suspicious for whatever reason to follow up or is judgment calls based on that. I mean, you have to have something to be able to follow up on. I mean, that's important. 
that's why a license plate, a description, you know, then we can go back and maybe the restaurant has surveillance video that they record and store. We're able to maybe get a little bit more details on it. But something evidence-based for something that's like factual that can be followed up on is kind of the key. Yeah, it has yeah, it has to be something. It can't be just I saw this or that and it happened last week. Or it happened, you know, and that's another thing too. We've had calls, it's like, you know, don't be afraid to to call 911 if if you're absolutely sure something's going on. You know, the tip lines, you know, if they call and leave a tip, usually the investigator will get the the call, you know, within an hour or two or whatever. But if it's an emergency and it's something that's threatening right away, that's when you call local authority. I mean, we've had some calls where they probably should have called 911 because it was happening right then and there. Instead, they called the tip line and now we're not able to, to do anything because it's a day later. So again, it's a judgment thing. You know, don't call 911 just because you see something. There's got to be a little bit more to it, like somebody's getting beaten or somebody's getting dragged by their hair or, you know, something that they can respond to immediately. You know, then, you know, you can build your case. We've built a lot of cases backwards. You know, it's, it's, and that's, that's how some of these cases go. It's not, you know, something happened and then you go forward. It's, it's already happened and you, you build the case going backwards. Okay, thank you. Um, Julie, this one would be directed at you, um, came privately as well. If you're willing to answer this one, someone was curious about where your children stayed while you were being trafficked. Um, my parents actually uh, were willing to watch them and I just had to make up so many excuses uh, for where I was going. Also, my ex had um, access to them too and had them for different um, occasions. So. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. And see, um, what can the community do to help survivors in a general sense? It's been partially answered, but is there just more volunteering, fundraising, keeping an eye out? Taking training seems to be really good to help educate and then help educate others. Um, open question for anyone. I think education is so huge. You've, some of the comments that are happening in the chat right now are, you know, talking about rumors sometimes that social media comes up with about human trafficking and what it looks like. And, you know, there was a question about a certain hand signal. And I see a lot of rumors and misinformation on social media spread specifically about trafficking so becoming really educated on what it really looks like because you know as i mentioned I, I really do think it looks differently in real life than people might think um doing the on watch training um doing some of the ECPAC training just being really educated and then um donating to programs that serve this population and spreading the word um educating others um spreading awareness um volunteering i don't know am i missing anything faith something that i would like to say is that like how i said earlier english is my third language so you might come across that somebody only speaks spanish or they don't even speak spanish and that's where somebody comes in and helps translating as well so that can also happen. Um, the other thing that they can think of would be just keep get trainings on watch is a wonderful resource. Um, and I love their trainings as well. I have taken them. <laughs> uh, and, and it's amazing. And I just share a link. It's called socialidentityquest.com. Actually, it will take your kids there, teenagers, to to look into social media like if they it will ask you questions for example like you sent a picture who do you report it go to your parents send the picture like it will make your kids think before they do something and if they did it where to go and ask for help so that one it is a really good resource 
I work on it two years ago and it came out barely last year, I believed. So that one is a very good one for those who have teenagers. Even if you are an adult, that, that would still help you anyways. Thank you. And so yes, um, tying in another question asked about organizations that do school presentations, that's the same for the EGPAT and the other one that you mentioned just now. Um, and so yes, training, education, like from recognized organizations that are doing this is one of the best ways to dispel disinformation and also gain the best information on to help yourself and others around you. Um, let's see. There was one more that came to me. Um, and then so if not, I think that's the last of the questions. So last shout out if there's any other questions for anyone, and then we'll just have some wrap up thoughts. But last question is, is um, how often does pornography play into human trafficking? I've heard that is a close association. Again, open question for anyone. Very frequently, very frequently, a lot of times the trafficking is, you know, photographed, video, um, and, you know, adult and child pornography is a huge part of trafficking. Okay, so um, I think there aren't any more questions coming in. So Wait, let's see. Um, I'm just making, I'm just catching this on the chat myself. And so, yes, I will give everyone the opportunity um, to have any wrap up thoughts of just things that they can take away from this, what's important. Um, does there any last thoughts that you want to share before we conclude for the evening? I would want to say to share this to your neighbors or on social media like tell uh, your friends that to listen survivors to listen julie's story to listen my story to listen these other survivors story so they don't become a victim but then at the same time to support us and support our work that actually does make a big difference for sure and i would just say you know Unfortunately, sex trafficking happens here in Utah. And so I think we just need to recognize that and, you know, not be in denial that it, it's a problem for other countries or other states. You know, this is happening here in Utah and we, it's a horrible crime. It's horrible trauma, um, but there is hope. And, you know, Dahlia's Hope is, is one of those programs that provides that, but um, we have, there is hope for, for these survivors, but we just can't be in denial. And, we have to recognize that this is happening in our community. Yeah. One other thing too is, is there's there's also labor trafficking too that uh, is out there, and that's that's really uh, prevalent as well. Um, and it also creates victims and or people as well in those kinds of cases. All right. Thank you guys. Thank you for our wonderful, incredible panelists. Thank you for attending and for listening. We couldn't do this Let's Be Neighbors series without your interest and support as well. Um, to conclude with the last question is yes, there will be a recording made available. Tomorrow is actually National Human Trafficking Awareness Day, like the official day. And so um, wear blue if you are so inclined and um, we will try as quick as we can to see if we can get the recording out. For that but if not it is national human trafficking awareness month thank you again and have a most pleasant evening everyone <laughs>